I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. The government knows. I've been hiking various sections of the Pacific Crest Trail and preparing myself for a future goal to hike the entire trail from Mexico to Canada. Since I live in Oregon, it makes it easy to practice until I retire in four years. I've always enjoyed challenges like this, and combining the beautiful scenery with an endurance test has been my dream for several years. I was hiking a section of the PCT last summer, and I had a terrifying experience that shook me bad enough that I had to report it to the ranger district in Eugene. But the on-duty deputy told me they have heard a lot of hikers tell similar stories. However, without photos and positive proof like a Bigfoot body, they are all following a policy of neutrality. So I asked them if their policy is to deny this creature's existence until somebody produces a dead body. He just looked me over his glasses and answered, You got it. I was on the PCT in the area of Three-Fingered Jack Mountain on my way to Mount Jefferson, and my plan was to go all the way to Cascade Locks on the Columbia River. My hiking partner was still on her summer break. She's a teacher in Lane County, and we had planned this hike carefully. After three days of covering a lot of ground, we decided to make camp and spend a couple of days just relaxing and doing nothing. We were probably a mile from the main trail in a beautiful meadow surrounded by an evergreen forest of huge trees. They were so tall, they blocked out the views of the mountains around us. Our camp was on a flat bench near a small stream that trickled down to a large meadow covered by a carpet of wildflowers. Several large elk crossed far below us, and we just sat and watched them graze along. When suddenly, we heard a screech that we first assumed was an alarm call from a bull elk that had gone ahead of the others. With that, they all fled downhill and into the heavy timber on a dead run. We didn't know if there was a hunter coming, and since we don't hunt, I don't even know if it was hunting season. We watched the meadow for a long time for signs of whatever spooked the elk, and finally we saw something moving along the trail the elk had taken. At first we thought it was a large bear, and we watched it cut across the corner of the meadow the way the elk had gone. Although we first thought it was a bear, it seemed strange as it was walking on its back legs. But then we realized that its front legs looked like human arms but much larger. Then the creature lifted its head high and turned like it had caught a scent in the air. Suddenly, it looked directly at us, and then it dashed into the trees. We were both speechless, and we just looked at each other. After a few moments, we agreed that we had to know. So leaving our packs at camp, I pulled out my 9mm pistol that I carry out of self-defense, mostly from humans, as animals avoid people. Cautiously approaching the place we first saw the creature, we talked aloud to make sure that it knew we were coming, as it seemed it had been afraid of us when it ran. I was sure that we were more afraid of it, but we had to know. The place where it crossed the corner of the meadow and where the elk had run away was fairly devoid of grass and mostly short stubble. It seemed to be an established trail with both elk and deer tracks in abundance. There were several much deeper tracks atop the others and four large prints that looked human except that they were huge and looked strange. The toes all looked the same, and it was hard to tell if there were four or five toes, as the soil was damp, and by the time we got there, the prints were filling with water and caving in. We both decided that the fun had gone out of our adventure, and we headed back uphill to our camp. The breeze changed and was headed up the valley toward camp when we smelled the most god-awful odor you can imagine. It smelled like something rotten. Having once worked for a slaughterhouse for a major meat company, I had become, I had been familiar with the smell of rotten meat, but this was the most putrid stench that I could recall ever smelling in my life. My friend and I quickly packed up our camp and beat it back to the PCT and departed the area at a very fast pace. We met some hikers going south on the trail and related our experience to them. They answered in chorus, Bigfoot. In no uncertain terms, they gave us the assurance that we had done the right thing by leaving the area, and since they were headed the way we had come, they said they were going to camp that night far away from where we described our camp had been. We find it hard to believe that our government agencies won't formally admit to the existence of Sasquatch, so at least they can tell hikers and campers how to avoid it. Thank you. Stan Messerly
My husband and I live out in the countryside of Washington State, and we run a cute little vegetable farm together, right along the banks of the Green River. It's just a small operation. We've got about five acres of rich soil where we grow all kinds of crops, like carrots, peas, tomatoes, and squash, and we also raise chickens for eggs. I just love living out here, surrounded by nature and growing our own food, and the farm has been in Jack's family for years. We feel so lucky to call this peaceful place home. For the past few seasons, everything on the farm had been going along nice and quiet, like normal. Then, about a month ago, some very strange things started happening that made me start to wonder what exactly might be hiding out there in those woods. The first sign of trouble was our chicken feed. We store big bags of it in the coop to easily feed our flock of 25 hens. I noticed the bags were looking a little less full than usual. We do get the occasional raccoon or possum around here at night, so I figured one of them was sneaking a bite. But pretty soon, way more was missing every day than any normal critter could eat. Almost half the bag would be gone sometimes. My husband even started joking that we must have a bear coming around. I then, of course, made sure to lock up the coop nice and tight each evening when I closed up the chickens for the night. Well, things got even more worrisome when our chickens started disappearing. Every few days, I'd do a head count, and one or two chickens would be just gone, vanished into thin air. We never had predators like coyotes or foxes bother our chickens before, and I knew I latched their coop securely shut when I took them in each evening. So we started speculating what in the world could be getting our chickens when they were locked up safe and sound like that. We were just plumb confused and must have checked those latches a dozen times a day to make sure they were tight. And then the mystery became clear as day when I made a disturbing discovery one morning out in the coop. When I opened up the hen house, I immediately noticed the heavy wire mesh fencing around the run was bent almost into a tunnel shape, like something had pulled it back with an amazing amount of force. It was opened wide enough for a full-grown chicken to get snatched right out. Then I looked down, and I saw these gigantic, bloody footprints pressed into the ground. They were shaped sort of like a bare human foot, but easily twice the size. The prints went from the broken fence around to the back of the coop, I didn't know what exactly I was looking at, but a chill went down my spine, realizing something very strange had been out here. A couple of nights later, the weirdest sound woke me up in the middle of the night. From the woods, I heard this kind of mournful-sounding whooping noise. My husband slept like a log right on through it. I was real uneasy, knowing that something was roaming around our farm at night. The next evening, right around dusk, I finally laid eyes on the culprit. I was finishing up some chores when this sort of apish-looking creature came sneaking out of the tree line. It was stooped over but walked upright on two legs, and it couldn't have stood more than four feet tall. It was too far to make out much detail, but the thing was definitely covered in hair and looked like a young Bigfoot. I watched it in shock as it crept up to our coop, snatched a chicken that had wandered too close to the broken fence, and scurried off back into the woods with its prize. That's when all those strange happenings clicked. We had our very own Bigfoot neighbors out there stealing our chickens. You're probably thinking I must have been scared to death, but the honest truth, looking at this gangly young one, he looked kind of sad. I didn't sense anything mean or vicious about it. After thinking it over that night, I realized that this young Bigfoot was probably just hungry and saw our chickens as an easy meal and it didn't seem right to be angry when it was only following its instincts to eat. Talking to my husband about it, I thought we could find a way to live with our new forest friend, so we came up with an idea to leave some food out as a kind of a peace offering. So I assembled a big basket filled with heads of lettuce, carrots, squash, peas, and tomatoes from our fields, and adding in a heaping scoop of chicken feed for good measure. That night, I left the basket right at the edge of the tree line, hoping this would show the Bigfoot that we were friendly. The very next morning, the basket was empty, with not a single veggie scrap or a feed kernel left behind, and resting there in the bottom of the basket were a few scraggly hairs that must have come off our visitor when it leaned in to get the food. Over the next week or so, we kept putting the basket out each evening, and it never failed to be empty by sunrise. This went on for some time, and we haven't lost a single chicken since. We can't see the Bigfoot, but I know it returns each night to collect the offerings. I feel so enlightened to know these beings actually do exist, 
and it's like we have a special friendship with the Bigfoot clan living in our forest. And I don't mind one bit doing my small part to nourish them. Who knows, maybe they're even protecting the rest of our farm from other predators. And when folks claim Bigfoot is only a myth, I just smile, thinking about the one I've come to know, and it reminds me how little we understand about our world. I'm a retired Minnesota game warden and pilot. My patrol area was in the northeastern part of the state, which is mostly wilderness. In the 1980s, I was patrolling a vast lake in my patrol area on a very nice day. I decided to tie the boat up on shore and walk across a peninsula to observe any fishing activity in the next bay. I spotted a man still fishing in a boat about a hundred yards out from me. I concealed myself and sat down. He did not move once. I put my binoculars on him to see what was up. Within a moment, he started fidgeting and looking all around. He had his back to me and turned and looked directly at me. I was completely hidden, so he did not hear or see me. He started his boat and came to shore about 30 yards down the hill from me and started looking around underbrush and behind trees. I thought that he must have hidden a pile of fish somewhere and decided to let him pick it up before I picked him up. He looked from side to side, back to where I was, and all around. After a few moments of this, I realized that he was looking for me. I was startled by this, but also very cautious. As he walked around and started to get further away, I mentally told him to come back, and he did so, each time, until he walked up to the brush in front of me, spread it apart, and looked me right in the eye. I said, how you doing? And he said, I knew someone was watching me. I said, have a seat and let's talk. We soon discovered that we were both army vets, and he said that he had found he had the skill while in Vietnam, and it saved his life many times. I have felt this sixth sense many times when working, and always took it as a warning, get the hell away and find another route. What this guy did was terrific. He knew I was not dangerous. I forgot to check his fishing license. After a feat like that, a handshake was more in order. Jump ahead 30 years or so. A group of us outdoor types shot sporting clays and we were sitting on the deck of the clubhouse and the subject of Bigfoot came up. I mentioned that I had doubts about any primate living in the wild in Minnesota in the winter because they lose body heat too fast and the calories needed would not be obtainable. We do get to minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit and colder here. My teammate spoke up and said he had seen one. He managed a mining supply company and was traveling between towns and had to take a leak. He pulled off on a side road close to where his hunting shack is and stopped by a power line. As he was doing his thing, he looked down the hill to a small swamp and saw a huge figure pulling cattails out. After a moment, the figure stopped, turned around and looked at him. It then ran to a poplar tree, hid behind it and looked at him from side to side, not realizing that his shoulders were four times the width of the tree. Nobody in the group said a word. Three of us were retired law enforcement, and some were loggers or miners and log cabin builders, all outdoorsmen. I broke the silence and asked where he was exactly when this happened. He said, right near Eveleth, Minnesota, close to me and one of our coldest towns. I've never seen or found a sign of a Bigfoot during my working years, and if I had, I would have had to keep my mouth shut until retirement. My friend said it spooked him, and he told no one except his wife and hunting shack partner. I believe my friend. This happened in 2006. I was hunting in central Oregon on the east side of the Cascade Range, trying to bag a big blacktail. I had my base camp set up at 4,000 feet in a small clearing about four miles from any road. I had spent the first two days scouting and found a buck that I wanted to try for, so on the third morning, I set off an hour before sunrise and started heading up the slope to a good spot where I could easily see a couple of meadows at first light. I got set up, leaned my rifle against the tree, and started wiping the dew off my binoculars and opened up a power bar. It was still a little too dark to see, so I started turning my eyes into the meadow while I ate my breakfast. So, first light comes and I start glassing the meadow. I heard some noise off to my left, the west, it sounded like something was coming up the ridge. It was going to come out into the small neck that fed into the meadow. I turned and I got my rifle up, assuming it was a deer. I can see movement in the brush about a hundred yards to my west, but the brush was thick enough I couldn't make it out, but could tell it was not a deer. 
Eventually, I could make out that it was upright, so I assumed it was another hunter. He got to the edge of the meadow and stood there, kind of crouching behind some bushes. I'm getting a little PO'd, as someone else has got into the same area I was in. I hadn't seen a soul in the two days. I had scouted for human tracks. I rose up slowly and whistled at the guy, waving my right arm over my head, letting him know, Hey, there's a hunter over here. Go somewhere else. He immediately wheeled to his right to face me directly. When he did that, I could see that he was immense across the shoulders. I'm six foot two, 220, and he made me look like a child. As soon as he saw me, even though it was dimly lit, I could tell we were looking at each other, and he ducked down into the bushes. I thought, what the heck? So I set my rifle back against the tree and stepped out into the meadow so he could get a clear look at me. I started walking towards him. I want to hunt this area. I want him to go somewhere else. There was plenty of time for him to leave and do that. I took about five steps, and he stood up again. This time, I could tell it was not a man. It was just too damn big and covered in hair. He started grunting at me and shaking the bushes in front of it. My rifle was leaning against the tree where I had originally sat. I raised my binoculars up and looked at his face. I can't tell you a ton of details. I was totally startled. He had dark hair, certainly all over what I could see. Except for the face, there was a lot of flesh, a broad forehead, broad nose, big lips, a huge set of shoulders, and huge chest. I couldn't see his legs very well because of the brush, but I have spent countless hours looking through binoculars and a rifle scope. I know exactly what I'm looking at when I'm looking. This was no man, it was no ape, and it was no joke. The whole event only took a matter of minutes, but it never stopped grunting, growling, and shaking the bushes at me. Though it never came out in the clearing or towards me any further, it certainly made me feel like it did not want me there, and I was in danger. He was downhill from me, so it was hard for me to get a judge on his height, but the bushes were clearly four to five feet tall, and it was well above those. I'm going to guess it was a good seven or eight feet tall, with shoulders a good four feet across, with massive arms and the head was also massive in proportion to a human. I was within 95 yards of this thing with a clean light of sight, looking through quality optics. I have never seen anything like it before or since, and I do not ever want to see another one. It was truly a spooky deal. I instinctively backed up, I picked up my rifle, shouldered it, and centered the crosshairs on his face. It stared at me intently and very menacingly. It would have been an easy shot. Still, something told me inside not to shoot. Something told me it was absolutely the wrong thing to do. So I held my rifle up with my right hand and raised my left hand over my head and looked at him in submission. I didn't know what else to do. I slung my rifle, picked up my backpack, and headed back down the trail to camp, never looking back. I never heard him or saw him again. I got back to my tent and packed up everything, headed down to the truck, went to town, Stayed the night in town. In the morning, I drove to a new hunting area, 35 miles to the north, to finish out my trip. I didn't want to waste my tag or waste my vacation time, so I tried my best play. I ended up unsuccessful in filling my tag that season, and yes, I was rattled the whole time. I've only told my family and a few close friends. My son believes me. I don't know if anyone else does or doesn't. I don't really care. I've got nothing to prove to anybody. I know what I saw, and as I said, a man's word should be enough. I've had two encounters in the Chattahoochee National Forest in North Georgia. My first encounter affected my hunting partner more intensely than me. We had camped out the night before our hunt and had set out our climbers up on trees we had selected in some promising spots for white-tailed deer that we scouted earlier that day. About 4.30 a.m., we made our way to our climbers, and I was set up about a quarter mile from my buddy. I was about 30 yards from a very steep ridge, overlooking a narrow ridge trail, where I had seen in the past several black bears and whitetail using the trail that crossed in front of my fairly concealed location. My buddy was overlooking the same ridge a quarter mile away on a knoll near some thick laurel that grew on the base of the ridge, with several funneling deer trails below the ridge that he could watch down below. Waiting for the first light is always exciting as the woods are very calming and quiet. Any noise by an animal definitely does not go unnoticed. 
So I'm enjoying the quiet serenity of the woods until about 15 minutes before first light, when I began to hear what I thought were owls hooting. But they sounded louder than owls, with more of a booming noise, with much larger lung capacity than an owl. The noises then began to sound like whooping sounds, and I heard several whoops, then a brief pause of about two minutes. I then heard three successive tree knocks. This was all coming from my buddy's area, and I was concerned. I thought my buddy might have been fooling around. Then I realized that he could not duplicate these noises, nor would he be so irresponsible to screw up a hunt that we spent so much time to prep and set up for. I then became extremely concerned once I rationalized this, so by now I was on edge and listened intently. It began to get light enough where I could see it was very foggy out. Actually, it was cloudy at our elevation, and I couldn't see but 30 yards away from me. Just then, I got a text from my buddy that said, Get your ass over here. I figured he nailed a big buck with his crossbow and needed my help dragging it. So I immediately replied, Okay, I'm coming. I get down, grab my gear, and quietly headed his way. So just to let you know, we've been hunting for 25 years together, and we never talk loudly in the woods, and if we see each other, we always use hand signals or a quick whistle to alert our positions. When I got close to his spot, I climbed the knoll, and I knew he was downhill about 80 yards from the crest. As soon as he saw me, he yelled, Get over here! Did you hear that? I got an angry look on my face, and I put my finger over my lips like, Shh! He said, No! Screw that crap! These mother effers surrounded my tree! Did you hear that? By this time, I was about 20 yards from him, and I could see he was white as a ghost, and quite visibly shaken up. He was freaking out and shaking like a leaf. I've never seen this man scared of anything in the woods, but I knew he was serious, and with the noises I heard, it began to sink in as my mind raced. Just then he said they were making these whooping noises and hitting trees with sticks in a triangular pattern to communicate their position. They got closer and closer and then started getting louder and were throwing large rocks near my tree, but it was too dark to see them. And look! They left tracks. He pointed to the ground about 20 yards from the base of his tree he was in, and sure as heck, there was a set of prints in a semicircle pattern pressed deeply into the matted, leafy ground. The ground was soft enough that the tracks sank about three inches deep in some spots. To best describe these tracks is sort of unlike most Bigfoot tracks we're used to hearing about. Instead of being unusually wide, these tracks were narrow, like a human foot with a pronounced heel a narrow arch that connected to a wide ball of the foot. The big toe looked to be the size of a serving spoon, and the small toes looked like they were one pad, possibly because of heavily matted hair made them appear to be connected like one pad. This set of tracks was about 16 inches long. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Then it all just hit me as I took it all in, and suddenly I felt overwhelmingly euphoric, almost like the air was charged with a calming agent. I calmed my buddy down and said, Holy crap, you lucky mother. He said, Lucky? I almost crapped my pants. Those buggers terrorized the crap out of me. While I was mesmerized by studying the tracks, he was standing guard scanning our perimeter, as one would do during wartime while surrounded by the enemy. I told him I doubt they'll be back now that it's light, and he calmed down a bit, but not much. We began looking for tracks together because he did not want to leave my side. Crazy because I've never seen him act so childlike. He was real shaken up, still wide-eyed and puffing on a cigarette with his hands shaking. We scanned the area and I found three other sets of tracks, one on the edge of the knoll in a semicircle pattern, another set about 70 yards from that. It looked like the tracks just appeared, then the last track was set really deep as if it rested its weight on its right foot were all crouching to look at the trail below the ridge. It looked like it was trying to conceal itself behind a large white pine. We found several spots where large rocks were just removed from the ground near the tracks. We saw some older tracks on the other side of the knoll where you could easily tell one straddled a log and lifted it to the side to forage for grubs in the soft soil underneath. There were scratch marks in the soil still. I didn't find any hair, which is what I was hoping for. At this point, my buddy was pretty stoked and seemed excited that our suspicions of these creatures had been solidified firsthand. The tracks ranged from roughly 16 to 18 inches long. 
Both he and I have told our story to several hunters and DNR officers because we know what happened and we don't give a crap if people believe us or not. We figure we'll take a chance and maybe we'll run into other outdoorsmen that have had similar experiences, which we have, including a Native American guy who shared a similar story and found tracks in a semicircle pattern also, which kind of freaked me out. We have had confirmation that the creatures exist up there after talking to a couple of DNR officers that have seen and heard these creatures and have confirmed stories told to them by several hikers, hunters, and campers. They told us that they believe they're migrating hunters and we happen to be in their spot this season. They actually thanked us for being brave enough to tell them what happened so they could tell their other DNR guys to be on the lookout. It was refreshing to talk to these guys that didn't treat us like crazy whack nuts because they have had their own experiences. Also, we have shared our story with other hunters who think we flipped our friggin' lids and they laugh it off. Which, I really don't care either way. Thanks for listening. Be sure to watch the three-hour December prize giveaway video. Same as before, watch the video and comment the secret word and your favorite story. Happy Holidays and good luck.